On October 31st, 1984, around midnight, the tanker Puerto Rican was beginning a journey from San Francisco to New Orleans. It was plying its trade of calling on ports and harbors and would take chemicals into its tanks, go to its destination, offload them, take on new chemicals, and finally end up in its next destination. The problem arose, of course, when it sailed out of the Golden Gate the evening of its last voyage. Guided out of port by a pilot boat, the 632-foot-long craft carried a crew of about 30 and a cargo of nearly 92,000 barrels of lubrication oil and additives and 8,500 barrels of bunker fuel. It was a clear, dark night. Everything looked great. I was just about uh, maybe eight hours away from finishing up my work and going on a 30-day vacation. The two vessels, pilot boat and tanker, were tied together. But at 3.30 a.m., as the pilot boat skipper was preparing to disengage the tanker and return to his vessel, the night sky lit up with terrific intensity. I had my hand on the railing, and I was just about ready to go down when I heard a click, a whoosh, and a bang. I basically kind of remember the ship exploding, but I don't remember anything else till I was way up in the air. I, I must have been 200 feet up in the air. So as I was coming down, I actually saw the ship exploding in kaleidoscope form was going click, 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 like uh, it's unbelievable, like a slideshow. The Puerto Rican had turned into a fireball. Within minutes, the United States Coast Guard scrambled a rescue response. We got a report from a C-130 aircraft, which is one of our large four-engine aircraft. Uh, it was about 15 miles off the coast. And that report um, told us that there was about a 40 to 50 foot plume of flame leaping up from the vessel. And so we knew it was very, very serious. The pilot survived along with a crewman who was badly burned. But a second crewman thrown overboard by the blast was never found. The explosion had blown the tanker in half. It spilled 1.4 million gallons of oil into the bay. The timing of the disaster created special challenges for the Coast Guard, which not only had to rescue survivors, but would also try to clean up the spill. This explosion, of course, as I said, happened at night. So how much oil was in the water immediately, we couldn't even see. But at first light, we were able to see it was trailing from the vessel. And we were very much at risk of losing the entire cargo, which was about four million gallons. A few days later, during heavy weather, the Coast Guard's worst fears were realized. The rear portion of the vessel sank about 25 miles off the coast of San Francisco, releasing even more oil into the bay. And it took with it about 8,000 barrels of fuel oil. And uh, at the time, some of that oil leaked out and continued to leak for some time afterwards, about 20 barrels a day, I think. The Coast Guard's response involved specially equipped oil spill recovery vessels. These boats have floating barriers that funnel oil into tanks or large rubber bladders. The Coast Guard sent planes aloft to drop detergents on the oil to disperse it. In the weeks after the disaster, the Coast Guard's environmental specialists worked to mop up the spill. Simultaneously, maritime police, Coast Guard investigators, and private failure analysis contractors were looking for the cause of the disaster. They studied the remains of the tanker, which was in dry dock. A dependable feature of explosives and explosions is that objects move away from the center of an explosion, generally in the direction that when you plot a point of their initial position to their final position, they point back to what blew them away. This was not exactly rocket science because the ship split there. <laughs> so it pretty, left a pretty clear signature. So we knew the tank area where the explosion occurred. Investigators focused their efforts on tank number five. Curiously, that tank had carried nothing explosive for almost six years. But the blast had left something behind, soot. Investigators believed the inky black substance might have held clues to the mystery. Looking down on the ship in dry dock, you see the, the most prominent feature is the folded back deck. It's black. It's carbon black. 
That's soot. To determine the constituents in the soot, there are several um, investigatory tools that are very powerful at identifying for us the very molecular and atomic constituents that led to that soot. The most powerful tools we find in this endeavor are some combination of gas chromatography or mass spectrometry. What these tools basically do is you take a complex chemical mishmash like soot and you want to break it into its constituents so you can identify them individually. The analysis revealed that one of the compounds involved was caustic soda. By itself, caustic soda is not explosive. But as investigators would learn, it leaked from the holding tank, combined with other elements, and formed a dangerous brew. Investigators went inside and found a hole at the top of the tank. A problem they believed that occurred because one of the welders who made the tank didn't seal the seam completely. The hole burned through the tank was actually easier to find than you might think because large expanses of a tank wall are just flat, featureless. And if you're in this business very long, you recognize that problems in workmanship don't come up typically in long, straight areas that are easy to weld. Problems in workmanship usually manifest themselves in complex, cramped geometries around corners and struts in a place that's not so accessible and not so easy for the workman to see his work. The hole in the tank was enough to provide passage into a void area between tank five and its neighbor six. Eventually the bilge space became filled with a soup of caustic soda from a preceding voyage. This caustic soda soup combined with a zinc coating used in the bilge area and formed hydrogen gas. Then the hydrogen exploded, ignited by a spark of unknown origin. If hydrogen finally builds up in concentration to its lower explosive limit, it will find an ignition source. Remember, this is the same stuff in the Hindenburg. So we have this incredible conjunction of events. And indeed, in our business, we see that major disasters are very often the, string, the result of a string of very low probability events that just all come together bad that day. The Puerto Rican tanker explosion had implications for the U.S. Coast Guard, which improved its response to hazardous material spills. And although authorities acknowledge that the explosion was a freak accident, the disaster did create change in the shipping industry. The Marine Board of Investigation uh, suggested that there were preventative measures that could have been taken to prevent this explosion in the first place. Better inspection techniques, perhaps during the yard period or other opportunities the vessel had to be inspected, may have found uh, this gouge and it could have been repaired. You gotta start looking for things like if volumes of cargo start disappearing in voyages, and in this particular case, they were, in the case of the ship, this cannot go without some affirmative action. And indeed, it would be very straightforward to determine you've got a leak because cargo is showing up in the bilge water. If those determinations had been made, then the leak would have been located. It just would have been a matter of time. 